Hello, my name is Kate Crowley. I'm on the faculty in the program of Communication Sciences and Disorders at Teachers College, Columbia University. I have created these video modules with my co-author, Georgia Dwan. Welcome to Module 2 of Differential Diagnosis in Preschool Evaluations, a case study. In this module, we are going to look at the first part of the parent interview. In the parent interview, we look to the parent as the expert in her child's development over time and in various contexts to give us critical information leading to a differential diagnosis. Based on the research, information gathered from the parent is fundamental to the validity of a disability evaluation. In addition, over time, using clinical judgment, evaluators learn what questions provide important critical information from the parent. This is why we use what I call the critical questions to gather valuable information to assist in making our differential diagnosis. The critical questions. Language, dialect, acquisitional history. Parents' highest educational level. Parent history of speech, language problems. Family history of academic problems. Significant changes in the family structure. How do the students' communication skills compare with peers or siblings when they were the same age? Were the child's language skills in the evaluation representative or typical for him? Is the child clumsy? And please, between the time I first talk to the parent and when I see the parent, give me 10 examples of the best communications of that child and where it might break down. This parent interview must take place in person or by phone to allow for reframing of questions, follow-up, and clarification to collect essential data. The parent interview is best done before the evaluator sees the child as knowing about the language acquisitional history informs what to expect in terms of dialect, language, vocabulary, prior experiences, and so forth. Without answers to the critical question, it is very difficult to distinguish a disorder from something else. This something else can range from attending and memory problems, dialect and second language issues, and poor performance as a result of bias in the assessment materials such as bias related to kinds of prior experiences the child may have such as with vocabulary and books. What follows is the first part of the parent interview. Let's start with some of the critical questions. <laughs> so um, why don't you give me your, your educational background? Okay, so I am master's level school psychologist, yep. uh, bilingual, Spanish. Um, I've been working in CPSC for 14 years. Oh, wow. Yeah, my mm -hmm. whole career. Um, yeah. So you really know kids, too. Really yeah, familiar. preschool. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you and know I it. fell in love with them as soon as I started working with them. Yeah. And what about your husband? My husband graduated from high school. He's yeah. a commercial truck driver right now. Uh, yeah. Monolingual. What's his background? He's German, Irish, and Italian. Yeah. Okay. German, Irish, and Italian. Nice combination, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. So now I'm going to ask you a little bit about the language, dialect, acquisitional history. Let's um, start with you. So you do, you're all bilingual. Correct. And your mom is uh, from Spain. Your dad's from Colombia. No, Colombia. And your father's from Puerto Rico. Correct. Right. Uh, from the coast of Colombia? Bogota. Or? Bogota. Okay. Mm -hmm. So you were brought up, what's your history? My mom always spoke to us only in Spanish. Okay. Um, I have an older sister, she's about two years older, and uh -huh. my dad spoke to us pretty much in both. In both um, yeah. But even to this day, we're very comfortable speaking to him in English. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but if my mom's here, automatically the Spanish comes yeah, out. And even yeah. between my sister and I, we both speak Spanish, but we speak English to each other. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, now, with, so with what's his exposure to Spanish? I stayed home with him for the first four months, and I was really trying to expose him to Spanish. So yeah. nursery rhymes and reading to him, and then when I went back to work... But what about when you spoke to him without the nursery rhymes? Were you speaking Spanish to him, or were you speaking English? English. Yeah. I tried okay. to do okay. certain times of the day or certain activities yeah. where I did the Spanish. Yeah. But it's 
still very hard for me to stick to Spanish unless somebody else is here. Sure, sure. You know, if my husband's around English, it's very hard for me to stay in Spanish. Yeah. My brain automatically goes back to the English. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah but if my mom's in the room, the Spanish yeah. flows freely. Yeah. Um, so when I went back to work, my mom stayed with him full time and she only spoke to him in Spanish. And how long did that last? That oh my gosh, that was until he was about two and a half. So from four started. months to two and a half. Yeah. And how old is he now? He's two years, it's 11 months? 10. He'll be two eleven next week. Okay, super. Okay, terrific. Um, so up until four months ago? Up until I would want to say, about he was about two when he was primarily, Spanish was his first language. He had yeah. more words in Spanish. He didn't have that many words, which was initially where our concerns yeah. came up. Yeah. Um, but he was saying, agua mas, his first word was agua, uh -huh. um, agua mas, dame, um, luz, you know, simple yeah. things, and cuchara, tenedor, sí. everything related yeah. to food. Um, and then he would have some, some labels in English, but yeah. it was mostly Spanish. Um, and we started having concerns probably around 16 months. Uh -huh. And that's really where I started to work with him. And yeah. I guess at that point my focus really was just starting to see more expressive language, so I really focused on the English at that mm -hmm, point. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Receptively, I saw that he understood both. Yeah. You know, even to this day, my mom will speak to him in Spanish, and he'll either respond to her in English, or he'll just go and do follow the commands. Now, were you worried about his comprehension at 16 months? No. No. Okay. No. Okay. So receptive, you were fine with both English and Spanish, right? Correct. And at 16 months, did he have no words? or No, he had about maybe 10, uh -huh. 15 max. Yeah. Um, but you could, but he would, he was very good about saying more, mas, yeah, yeah, yeah. no mas. He wouldn't really label the objects. Yeah, yeah, he yeah. wasn't giving me, you know, animal sounds. He would, he would say mamam -mam for me, dada -da uh -huh. for dad. Um, it was very simple things like that. Uh -huh. So he would find a, a way to get around having yeah. to, re other than agua, that was really the only one that I would hear. I, on occasion he would say fun, yeah. but it was, he would yeah. just say dame or mas uh -huh. or no mas gotcha. instead yeah. of requesting or labeling. Yeah. And I would try and <laughs> he would go back to that because it was, it was almost like it was, it was, he was successful with those few right. words that he sure. had. Sure, sure, sure. And sure. he would resist That's even great. imitating at that point. That's good. I mean, that's, that's interesting. So then, um, so since, say, around 16 months when you start to do more English expressively, your mom was still coming and being Correct. here. Was she here, like, from she 8 to 6, here, kind of, or how? Oh, gosh, she would get here at 7 in the morning and probably leave at 4 p.m. Okay. And that was, I would say, no more than four days a week, but it was four days yeah, a week. four days a week. Yeah. That's great. And um, so then about 16 months, you you started to use all English after four whenever you were with him. But your right. mom still used Spanish yeah. with him. Yeah, yeah only Spanish. I yeah. made sure that she... That's great. You know, every so often she'll throw the English in and I'll hear her, but yeah. primarily Spanish. And then after 24 months, uh, so, uh, yeah, after 24 months, then, so about two and a half, you said, maybe I got two, your mom... Continue to be caretaker? She continued to be caretaker. At that point, he started getting speech privately. Okay, yeah. So the speech was in English. I couldn't find a bilingual therapist. Yeah. It was covered through the insurance. Yeah. He didn't qualify for early intervention. Right, right. Um, because receptively, they saw that he did well. Yeah, and even sure. even though expressively he had a limited vocabulary, yeah. it, it wasn't terrible for yeah. a two-year-old. Yeah. Yeah. I'd wanted to initiate the process before he turned two, but they told me to wait. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Because to see if there was an explosion of language. Or... But... If the deficit were... Oh, yeah, thank God that didn't happen. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, but he started receiving speech privately, I want to say, around March of 2014. Okay. March of 2014. Okay. And uh, your mom still takes care of him? Correct. Okay, so he's still getting a lot of Spanish. Yeah. Fantastic. That was four days, yeah. That's great. Yeah. And he's happy to speak Spanish with your mom? He... I don't, it's funny because I don't think he realizes some of the things that he says in Spanish. Like yeah. I don't think he realizes the nomas or the papa. Yeah, he always yeah, says yeah. papa or certain, very seldom will yeah. he use Spanish. But I don't think he's realizing the difference. Even we had a conversation the other day and he was asking me, again, he was showing interest in, you know, mommy Spanish? And I'm like, yes, mommy does speak Spanish. And then again, he said, 
Daddy English. And I'm like, yes, Daddy what? speaks English. And he went through the whole script again. And then I said, well, what about you? What language do you speak? And he said, like, Daddy. And I'm oh. like, yes, you speak English like Daddy, but you also speak Spanish. Yeah. And he just kind of looked at me. And I'm like, when you say no mas or when you say papa, that's Spanish. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he's funny. And he'll count in Spanish or yeah, things yeah, that yeah. he can say in Spanish. But so when your mom speaks to him, does so he respond in English now? He does like respond you did, in English. Like you and your sister did. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Correct. 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 First... We look for background information that helps us form a picture of the child and his family, such as the parents' educational levels, family history of speech and language problems, and who lives in the family. This is also where you're going to find out information about the languages and dialects the child has been exposed to currently and over time. We need this information to have an understanding of what to expect, given the boy's prior experiences and opportunities. We ask about the parent's educational level, which can be telling about the socioeconomic status of the family, which research has strongly suggested linked, is linked with education, such as exposure to books and vocabulary and the quality of language exposure. In this case, we want to draw attention to the fact that his mother is a bilingual school psychologist who has worked for 14 years with preschoolers with disabilities. She and her husband have created a rich learning environment in the home with books, puzzles, and toys. We already know that the mother will provide me with a great deal of information. Additionally, with her experience, she can share observations and insights that are going to be very useful to us as we work to figure out what is going on with Alex. Here is how we include this parent information in the final written report. This background information goes in the background information section at the front. Alex's mother has a master's degree in school psychology and has worked in preschools for children with disabilities for the past 14 years. His father is a high school graduate who is currently working as a commercial truck driver. Let's discuss the language background and use section. It could also be called language slash dialect background and use. This section looks at the current and historical exposure to various dialects and languages that this child has throughout his life. That is past and present exposure. Look, everyone has a cultural and linguistic background. And as evaluators, we have to learn about this if you are going to make an accurate diagnosis. For example, we must learn whether the child's language marks the features of a dialectal difference rather than a disorder. But every evaluation must have information on the child's language and dialect exposure over time and currently for every single child. We put this right after the background information section at the front of the evaluation. Why? Because the reader of the evaluation needs to know this information when they read it, even though we probably don't know what to write in this section until we as evaluators have finished gathering all the data for the evaluation. This section provides the reader with a cultural and linguistic lens through which they read the evaluation and have a deeper understanding of what we are saying in the evaluation. One of our most important tasks as evaluators is to bring the child to life for the reader through the written evaluation because generally the evaluator is not present in the review meetings to determine appropriate services. What is the child's proficiency in the various dialects and languages he is exposed to? What languages is this child hearing and or speaking? English? Spanish? Jamaican Patois? Is he exposed to the languages or dialects equally? How much exposure does he now have? What language is spoken at his preschool or daycare or by his caregivers? How has that exposure changed over time? As I mentioned, we evaluators collect this information throughout the evaluation, but we put our analysis at the front of the evaluation. The reader has to know this information from the beginning of the report in order to be able to read through and understand the evaluation. To help the reader understand this section, it is useful to end the language background and use section with a one or two sentence paragraph that summarizes what we found. 
that mini paragraph basically makes a summary of the relative strengths and weaknesses or relative proficiencies of the languages and dialects the child's been exposed to. Here, for example, is the summary of the language background and use section for Alex. Language background and use. During the evaluation, Alex responded to Spanish and English, but this was likely influenced by the fact that the evaluator used English during the parent interview. Nonetheless, Alex can understand Spanish, but has significantly stronger language skills in English. Background section, speech, language development, and prior services. His mother was concerned about his speech, but he did not qualify for New York State Department of Health Early Intervention Services. In New York State Department of Health, Alex would have qualified for early intervention services with a diagnosis of developmental apraxia. The family continued to be concerned about his speech and language development. In March 2014, the family contracted to pay a private agency to provide speech language services to Alex. Since March, Alex has received two sessions of speech language therapy each week from a licensed speech language pathologist. Another very interesting piece of this parent interview is how much the mother had an awareness of her child's issues in developing typical language. She wanted to have him evaluated before he turned two, as she had concerns, but they told her to wait till he turned two. So she had him evaluated at two years, three months old, and again at two years, seven months old. At that point, it was determined he didn't qualify for services offered by the New York State Department of Health because his comprehension skills were high and he had some expressive language. As we move through this evaluation, we realized that the first and second diagnoses were insufficient. Had he received a diagnosis of developmental apraxia, which I come to using differential diagnosis, he would have received services, but he didn't. In this next video, we see more of the parent interview as we continue to gather information about Alex. So any family history of speech and language problems? My cousin's daughter, so my I guess she would be my second cousin. Yeah. Um, she think she's also learning disabled and she has speech delays. And how old is she? Right now she's seventeen. And and you would you would say that is the case. It's not a, it's not a it's not a bad diagnosis. You think knowing no, your we, expertise? It's yeah. funny because I had her eval through my agency years ago yeah. when she was I think about to turn three. Yeah. So yeah, it was it was noticeable. Yeah. Then. Okay. And uh, anybody else? My husband's first cousin is on the spectrum. He was diagnosed in 1977. I think at this point he's Asperger's. Yeah. But other than that, we haven't really identified any others. And so no, besides that first cousin's daughter, the um, uh, you don't have any academic no academic no. problems, right? Yeah. Okay. First one. So and that that first cousin is. Um, uh, 1977 identified. Yeah. <laughs> that was a while ago, huh? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, any um, changes in the family structure? Um, you know, like any, well, obviously not divorce, but any, you know, he's had the same caregiver with same your mom. Caregiver. And the that. only thing new is in September he started school. Yeah, but no moving or anything no. like that. Yeah. Okay, so, I mean, not that's necessarily a bad mm -hmm. thing, but mm -hmm. it's good. Sometimes it ups, no. you know, upsets everybody. Um, so he started school, and tell me about where he's in school. So he is on the community portion of an integrated class. It's 12 students, one teacher, two assistants. It's one of the satellite schools that my agency services. Oh, okay. um, it's in Whitestone, Queens. Um, and the ages vary. He's one of the youngest. And yeah. Go, there's a few that are four already. So he's the youngest and up to four. So it'll go up to, he could stay there as long as he wants to. Right? Another of the critical questions is whether there is a family history of speech and language problems or academic problems. This is due, due to the genetic basis that associates communication disabilities within a family. The mother told me about her first cousin's 17-year-old daughter who has a learning disability and the father's first cousin who has Asperger's syndrome. I asked to confirm that they were truly diagnoses because there was so much over-referral in New York State that I wanted to make sure that these two truly had a disorder and ascertain that. And I did ascertain that from her responses. Next, we talk about any recent significant changes in the family structure. This question checks to see if there have been any, has been anything that would have a negative influence on the child's performance either during the evaluation or in overall development. 
It could be something like a serious family illness, death in the family, loss of the home through fire, having to live in shelters, going through a divorce, the birth of another sibling, or a change in caregiver. These changes can impact the way the child feels about himself, and it also can impact his development. There were no significant changes in this particular case. Finally, we get into the kind of preschool this boy is in now. He is in an integrated preschool as part of the community portion, which means he is considered a child without a disability, so he is one of the typically developing children in an integrated class with 12 students, one teacher, and two assistants. So it's a well-supported class. At least we would expect this from the teacher-to-student ratio. Here is how that information appears in the written evaluation. Preschool Experiences In September 2014, Alex began going to an integrated preschool where he is one of the community students, that is, students without disabilities. He started part-time, but his mother noted that Alex was having difficulties interacting with his peers. As a result, the family recently increased his preschool time, so he is now in preschool five full days a week. We continue on with more of the parent interview. No older siblings, no younger siblings, um, cousins and that kind of thing. Um, so, but it, then uh, compared to other kids his age now, how would you compare his language skills? Because you have experience with typically developing kids, not just the kids with special needs, right? Correct. Yeah. So because we have both. the integrating, yeah. Um, you know, I definitely, and I've always noticed it, yeah. he will avoid using the language that I know he has. Mm -hmm. So I see him very differently here than when he's interacting outside uh -huh. of the home. Yeah. You know, it's not a shyness because he goes up to people, he'll look at them, yeah. he smiles, yeah. he'll yeah, wave yeah, yeah, yeah. or he'll yeah. say hi, but he's he won't say, what's your name? And I know he'll do that because uh -huh. he'll ask me, he'll come over to me and start talking to me. Yeah, well, he's just talking like So I feel guys, like... like he, you know, I've always waved him. I'm like, does he have a language deficit yeah. in addition to the speech delay? Or uh -huh. yeah, is yeah, it yeah. just holding it back? Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. You know, that's been thrown about even with the speech therapist sure. that works with sure. him. And, you know, for sure, I think at this point, we feel that it holds him back. Yeah. Um, he'll avoid certain words. He was omitting a lot of words more. that are hard to understand. Words for that are hard for him to produce. So okay. he has a hard mm -hmm. time. You know, and I know I think some of it is developmental, like yeah. the L's, the TH's, the R's. So he won't say the or with. So he will just omit certain yeah. grammatical yeah. markers in right. his utterances. Right. So it makes it even harder for you yeah, to understand. Yeah, yeah. It's very mm -hmm. choppy. Mm -hmm. He's gotten much better with it recently. I would say within the last two weeks. Yeah. Oh, good. But yeah, this the, the samples you gave him were impressive to me. I mean, I, yeah. but consistent with what you're talking about now. Right. right. Yeah. Like he'll say it's on a table instead of the table. Yeah. Yeah, because yeah. he'll avoid the th because he yeah, can't do yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. Um, so it's it might be it might be a syntax versus a speech issue, which would be interesting to see. More right, and, and I spoken to you about Brand also the errors that he made. So I yeah. wonder if some of it is, I mean, whether or not it is like what he'll say. Um, what is it that he, he, he would say that I feel like reminds me of Spanish. Um, oh, no can do it. No can do it. Yeah, I love you that. Know, like, no, yeah. no can see it. So I don't know if some of it is the way he hears it in Spanish. Um, yeah. No lo puedo hacer o no. Sí. So I don't know. I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Interesting. He's got a lot of language, which is good. So, um, well, we'll see how he gets. Is he clumsy at all? No. Okay. Not on purpose. <laughs> No, I mean, but, yeah, he's not. That's no. interesting. And then I, you gave me your 10 best examples of his communication. I asked what is probably the most important critical question in terms of validity in the parent interview, according to the research. How does he compare to his same age peers or to his siblings when they were his age in terms of language development? The mother gives me some very valuable information about how he behaves with his peers. Although it's not exactly the answer that I was looking for, the answer she gave me is extremely important. What she begins talking about is something that makes me start to begin to shape the kind of issues this child may have. She says he is not shy. He talks to her. 
He won't ask children what's their name, but he'll come and ask her what their names are. When I was observing him during the evaluation, I saw him come to his mother and to me. He did a lot of talking. It was interesting to hear him say that he will not speak much with peers, and he intentionally avoids words and sounds that are hard for him, like the o, er, and f, v. At this point, I began to analyze and make preliminary inferences about Alex's speech and language based on what I learned from the parent interview. He will omit grammatical markers, so I say, thinking out loud, this may be a syntax problem, not speech. I haven't heard enough to make sense out of it, but I'm starting to investigate using my language lens. Is he really omitting grammatical markers because he doesn't have the syntax or the morphology for it? Or is he intentionally cutting sounds and words or substituting them because he knows they're difficult for him to produce? That would be a much more advanced task for a child who's two years, 10 months old. It turns out that was more like what we were seeing, but at this point, I didn't know for sure. The other interesting piece the mother gave me was it looked like had Alex had some language transfer of syntax from Spanish. He would say, no can do it, which comes from no lo puedo hacer o no puedo hacerlo. At this point, we are not sure whether language transfer has anything to do with what was going on with Alex. As it turns out, it did not. But at this point in the evaluation, we're not sure. Finally, the question, is the child clumsy, is something that Dr. Lisa Goffman at Purdue University has identified in children with specific language impairment. She has found that these children tend to fall in the low average range in terms of coordination and are considered clumsy, though not so clumsy that they would qualify for OT or PT services. However, we have found out that this boy is not clumsy, and we do include that in the evaluation. We have gathered some telling information from the first set of six critical questions. Most notably, Alex had di has difficulty at school communicating with his peers, although he is comfortable speaking with his mom. We learned that there is a history of learning disabilities in the extended family, so there may be a genetic component. However, his mother is a great strength for him because of her professional experience working with preschoolers with disabilities and because she and his father surround him with a rich learning environment at home. We continue to gather data from the parent interview in the next module.